The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire and get hired. ZipRecruiter technology has revolutionized the hiring world, and we're happy to have them as our presenting sponsor in 2018. It says here I'm supposed to say, welcome ZipRecruiter. You know, love it. I feel like ZipRecruiter is a great fit for our show. And why is that, John? I think that was supposed to be my line. What? Nope. <laughs> ZipRecruiter took the often challenging and inefficient process of hiring and created a smarter, simpler way to do it. Only ZipRecruiter has technology that scans thousands of resumes, immediately identifies qualified candidates, and prompts them to apply. I think that that was supposed to be, I think that was supposed to be my line. It was supposed to be a line that I was going to say. Right, it's right. Because it's in my wheelhouse. Right. Move on. It also learns which candidates you like and finds you more like that, so you never miss out on a great match. Right on. I got to tell you, A plus, whoever they got, whoever they got, you know, this thing is in turnaround. <laughs> ZipRecruiter has helped hundreds of thousands of businesses across all industries and sizes hire the right people, and they've helped millions of people find the right jobs. That's why ZipRecruiter is one of the fastest growing job sites in the world. Uh, <laughs> make hiring great again, ZipRecruiter. Love it. You get all the best lines here. <laughs> wow. Give me some of these great lines, ZipRecruiter. January is always a busy time for hiring, and right now, if your company's trying to bring on some talented new people, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked and start creating your job post. Once again, if you're hiring, try ZipRecruiter for free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash... Delta, give me my bag. Where's my bag, Delta? Give me the bag. Give me my suitcase, Delta. Crooked. Hey, Stockholm. Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. It's great to be here. This it is really our, is. Uh, this is our first stop on our European adventure. We're heading to Oslo and Amsterdam and London after this. But uh, it's been fun in Stockholm. How many people here are Swedes? Good amount of Swedes. How many people here are expat Americans? How many people here are from other sundry European locales? All right. That's huh. good. All right, good mix. Good split. Good split, yeah. Uh, and, other, uh, and other places. There's other places. Yeah. <laughs> you egomaniacs. Other. It's not about you. <laughs> One little bit of housekeeping for all of our pod listeners out there. Uh, next week... Tommy is hosting his first live Pod Save the World show in Los oh, Angeles. Yeah. Uh, Gotta get ready for that. On January 17th, tickets are on sale. Uh, it's going to have Ben Rhodes, Samantha Power, and the filmmaker behind the documentary, The Final Year, about the last year of the Obama administration. So if you guys are in Los Angeles, please check it out. We'll get you in for free if you're here, not if you're <laughs> listening. Let's start with the news. So I don't know what's happening in uh, Swedish politics these days, but... Over in America, we are in the middle of a spirited debate about whether the man we elected to lead our country is uh, mentally and emotionally fit to hold that job. A headline in Saturday's New York Times reads, Trump, defending his mental fitness, says he's a very stable genius. So that is very exciting for us. <laughs> Of course, uh, Donald Trump's mental fitness Who has can been... forget? Who can forget? <laughs> when Albert Einstein famously wrote that letter that said, I am a genius. <laughs> and when Newton, the apple hit him in the head and he said, I'm a genius. <laughs> a very stable genius. I'm a very stable, very stable genius. So, obviously, we've had this debate since Donald Trump ran for president. Um, but the latest kerfuffle is taking place because of a new book by Michael Wolff, called Fire and Fury, where he interviews most of Trump's advisors, friends, and family, who all come to a similar conclusion, which is that the president is sort of an idiot. Now, there's been a lot of questions about whether all of Wolf's reporting is accurate or embellished, but I guess my first question is, how much of it is surprising? How much, how much were you surprised reading that book, Tommy? I was not surprised about the fundamental character of 
Donald Trump. I mean, I think everything we've learned about Donald Trump over his entire career is that he's a narcissist. He doesn't give a shit about anyone but himself. Right. Uh, he's not particularly thoughtful or interested in learning about anything but his own news clippings and you know whatever is on cable news that instant. So I don't think like the basic thrust of what was reported is somehow new or revolutionary or you know like jaw dropping. I do think. To see a White House that has so little regard for the President of the United States when they're currently dedicating their lives to working for the man, uh, that they would shit on him to a person, including his own children like that, it, it tells you a lot about uh, what it's like being in that building, what they actually think of him. You know? And it sort of confirms all the things that we know from afar because he tweets things that you know, lead us to these same conclusions. What do you think, Levitt? Yeah, you know... It, it sort of confirms what we suspected I mean, or assumed. I think it is valuable insofar as it eliminates any doubt. I think even those of us who are very anti-Trump, there's a part of us that wanted to at least believe that it was 5% better than we feared, right? Just a, that the Trump we see on television is worse than the Trump that exists behind closed doors, that it's a bit maybe of a performance. Maybe there is some exaggeration. Maybe there is, right. Maybe there is maybe some exaggeration. Maybe we're exaggerating once in a yeah. while. Yeah, maybe we've taken this, a, not even just 10% too far. No. No. It's as bad <laughs> as we think. One, one of the things that's fascinating is it, it, it seems as though from everyone, from Rex Tillerson to Gary Cohn to, to Kelly to McMaster to his own children, it seems that it's not possible to come away from an interaction with Donald Trump or to hang up the phone with Donald Trump and, like, a lot of these guys have this inability to stop themselves from saying, what a fucking idiot, oh my god, <laughs> holy shit. Uh, over and over and over again, they hang up the phone and they're exasperated. Yeah, no, he, he is, I've said this before, a Fox News-loving, low-information voter who became president. But that's who he is. I mean, I think it's interesting because so much of the coverage of Trump and his presidency is... You know, and he's got this low approval rating, and Democrats hate him, and they've never hated him more, but the base loves him, and so it sort of, it becomes this partisan coverage, right? And what was interesting about this book is literally everyone who has ever worked with the guy, including family members, um, the Republicans in Congress, the people in the White House, his friends, they all think that maybe he has some sort of genius or, or intelligence when it comes to showmanship, salesmanship, marketing, yeah. but when it comes to any other policy issue, substantive issue, that he's just not that bright, that he can't focus. There's also been this thing, you know, when he first became president, everyone's like, is he distracting us with this, right? Is, he, is, he, is this some strategy to distract us from X issue and, and, and Y issue? And the truth is, He's the one who's distracted. He's not distracting us. Like, he can't focus on anything for more than a couple minutes. All he does is watch TV. As, and you've said this to me, like, he has access to the most secret, interesting information in the world, more so than any other human being on Earth, and doesn't seem like he wants to well, read any of it. And this, is, this, I think, is an interesting point, because the one thing people maybe gave him credit for was marketing and PR, and that he understood how to, like, sell a message to a nation. Right. I think his election maybe sort of led us to believe that could be true. The reality with this book is his team fucked up royally by the way they responded to this. This would have been likely oh, yeah. another 24-hour, 48-hour news story that just went away. I mean, literally, he had, there, there have been uh, North Korean nuclear tests that have had a shorter shelf life than this book because Donald Trump went out with this insane statement savaging Steve Bannon. And now, like, all of us are like, oh, my God, i got to download this right now. And his lawyer go out and, and send a cease and desist letter. So they have leaned into this thing so hard and made it this fascinating food fight that everyone wants a piece of. It led all the Sunday shows today. Um, and it's entirely because they fucked up the response. The Clinton people back in the day, remember, like, Philippe Reines is a, is a friend of all of ours. There was this devastating book that was supposed to come out about Hillary, and they managed to get a copy of it early, and they all read through it, and they found out the most salient points, and they leaked it to a reporter, and they gave a quote, can I be quoted snoring? Yawning. Yawning. Fuck. Let's <laughs> do this again. Edit this. And they gave a quote, can I be quoted yawning? <laughs> Amazing, right? Great quote. <laughs> and it killed the book. Because they just wrote it off as a nothing burger. Well, We're going to cut this, too. 
I've gotten so much shit from this guy for pulling that during live shows. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it in. Leave it all in. Leave now. it all in. Um, the, well, just one, and the other, one other thing about this. Uh, to Tommy's point, much as a tweet saying I'm a very stable genius is proof of the opposite, uh, <laughs> the book itself makes its own point. <laughs> what? I was just going to say, no, their, respo their response to the book proves that the book is true. The response to the book, book proves the point of the book. The book's existence itself makes the point that the book makes, which is that this is a White House that is off the rails, that there's no control. You know, Donald Trump tweeting, I didn't want to interview with this guy. This guy never did anything. I didn't want anything to do with this book. Michael Wolff, who's a sleaze, sleaze in the right place at the right time, used the fact that nobody knew what Donald Trump thought or cared about, that Donald Trump was erratic, that nobody knew where they stood, to get access to the White House over and over and over again, and to make these people feel comfortable enough around him to get endless, absurd quotes from them. Right. Because there was no one watching the store, no one who felt like they understood how the White House was supposed to be working, so that one of New York's sleaziest reporters could camp out in the West Wing for weeks on end. Yeah, I mean, you, you remember, like, Every administration deals with the first big book about right. the White House. Usually it's Bob Woodward and his, you know, he, he's one of the best credentialed reporters in the world. Uh, and what he would do is he'd have a source come to his house and park in his garage with no one would see you go in and out and his private chef would make you food. And he would say, all of your colleagues say, you're a disaster. <laughs> Why is that not true? And then they're like, vomit up all these attacks on their colleagues. You and had he, to work hard to put one of these books together. You had to be <laughs> sneaky about it. You had to ask tough questions. You had to work your sources. You had to be sophisticated. And we had to have done fucking Watergate. <laughs> now, you can just get yourself on the fucking emails. You get yourself on that, get yourself through security. You can just camp out there. Any one of you could have written this book. <laughs> all you needed was a visa. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it, <laughs> look. <laughs> Give it up for visas. <laughs> Other reporters have, you know, pointed out that there are certain uh, facts in the book that aren't facts at all. There are certain things that Wolf mm -hmm. made up, which is fine. But those same reporters and those same outlets have, through their own reporting over the last year, confirmed much of what was in the book. This is a staff and a president who they did not expect to win in the first place. Yeah. As soon as they did win, they got in there and then they thought, yeah, we deserve to be in here. And they had this chip on their shoulder the whole time that since uh, everyone was wrong about the, you know, guessing that we were going to win the race in the first place, all the criticism now must be wrong too. Yeah. Donald Trump, as we've said many, many times over the last year, is a 70-something-year-old who's never going to change. Right? He's all, you're not going to teach him anything new at this point. He doesn't want to learn anything new at this point. He just wants to watch... Fox television and sit in his bed and eat McDonald's and yell at the screen. Like, that's who he is. I mean, so at the, least William Randolph Hearst had the decency to go crazy in the privacy of his own home. <laughs> yeah, we have to all witness this now together. Now he's doing it in the public. He's doing it to us, to the whole world. What did you, um, <laughs> what did you say, Wolf? Where's the, he was the one that collected his pee in jars at the end, right? Who's sure. with me? Is that right? <laughs> Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. I was thinking of Howard Hughes. Leave it, it in. Leave it in. <laughs> you going to say something, Tommy, or did he I don't derail remember. your thoughts? All I can think about is pee in jars now. I just, so. real, I just well, I wanted to fix it. I'm glad I corrected yeah, yeah. it. Uh, what I was going to say is, I, I think what's interesting about the book is not just what it tells us about Donald Trump, which is what we already knew, but what it tells us about all the people around Donald Trump. Because it's hard enough to believe that we could get to a point in our country where we elected someone like this as president, but you would think that there will be institutions in place that would stop this from happening or at least alert the rest of the world and the rest of the country that this was going on. Um, the people in the White House are not those people. Yeah. And the Republicans in Congress are not those people L either. Love it called Michael Wolf a sleaze at the right place at the right time. That could be the name of the autobiography of almost anyone working in this White House. <laughs> right? Like That's Steve right. Bannon is just this shitty opportunist who happened upon the Trump campaign and you know, now he's at a downfall like nothing we've seen in, in recent history. And by the way, Steve Bannon uh, has not said that anything in the book is not true that he said. Um, Katie he Walsh. He recorded, by the way. He, yeah, so Michael Wolf has, in case you're wondering if, it, if some of this stuff is true, Michael, Wol Michael Wolf has tapes of Steve Bannon. He has tapes of Katie Walsh, who was the deputy chief of staff, who was also quoted extensively in this book. Everyone's upset about Katie being in it too, but no one has totally refuted what she said either. Um, so here's the, here's the scary thing. What does it say that 
our government is essentially on autopilot right now, that the United States government has, I mean, people have criticized other presidents in the past. Obama's not a leader, why won't he lead? Why, why isn't George Bush leading? Or he's, right now is a situation where we actually have, we just have someone who is watching television, tweeting about it, yelling about it, and looking at his press coverage, and decisions are then thrust on him um, that he, sometimes he doesn't want to make. And what does it sort of say, like, what do we do? What does it say about the country? What does it say about all of us that now we're sort of running on autopilot here, and how long can we last that way? Yeah, I, well, I mean, one of the things about Trump is, and this may be an exaggeration, but they talk about him as like sort of being functionally illiterate, or at the very least, not interested in reading memos that are long, not interested in engaging in policy conversations, or at least being in a room in a meeting where he's not the one talking for 54 out of 60 minutes, right? So to me, what that means is, uh, even if you have a staff that's undergoing a process, taking a really rigorous look at a very difficult challenge, let's say it's sending troops to Afghanistan or like dealing with a crisis in Yemen, he doesn't actually give a shit or wade in, which means you have these little you know, policy staffers like Stephen Miller or Steve Bannon or H.R. McMaster that can sort of de facto make these decisions by greasing the process or, or doing certain things their way. So you don't have anybody like you had with Barack Obama who was whacked for being aloof and professorial and for dithering because he would try to pick apart assumptions and get to the heart of what the reality of a problem is and not just sort of take on the Washington response that you know, we're doing X thing because that's the way we've always done it, right? So there is this autopilot feel which is going to run up against a big challenge at some point. We just don't know what and when. Yeah, I, I think the scary piece of this is the world is coming for Donald Trump at some point, right? There's no, every president deals with a crisis that demands them, demands that they perform the job. Um, he's already failed that when hurricanes have come, devastating hurricanes that have caused dislocation and misery. You know, Puerto Rico still needs a lot of help. That is a terrible and sad and uh, an enraging example of presidential failure. And it can get much, much worse than a storm. So I think that is a really terrifying reality. Uh, on the other hand, one of the sobering parts of this is that in the same way that when we thought Donald Trump would lose, we were all kind of realizing that the only, reason Donald, the only reason Donald Trump wasn't doing better in the campaign was not because our institutions were holding up, not because the media was holding up so well, but because Donald Trump was his own worst enemy. Um, and that's still true now. In many ways, you know, Donald Trump not wanting to do the job, not wanting to go campaign for health care, helped us in the fight to stop health care. Donald Trump not having an attention span, not being able to lead an organization is part of the reason he hasn't had more success on issues like immigration and hasn't had more yeah. success on some of his plans. It's, it's clear that the man has plenty of authoritarian impulses and that, um, you know, if, if he knew better, <laughs> might do some much scarier things. And the reason that he hasn't been able to be more effective is because he isn't that bright and he also didn't, also, he didn't bring a staff of people who are all ideologically committed in the same way. And it also speaks to, I think, the nature of the United States government where in the vast bureaucracy that is the executive branch, um, you are, the president is allowed to make certain political appointments in each department, but there also is sort of this vast group of civil servants in the Department of Defense, in the State Department, in the Justice Department, everywhere else. And those people, because of their hard work and because they are non-political and non-partisan in many ways, they have sort of kept the government running and kept us out of more trouble, even when we have a president who is, you know, completely, manifestly unfit for the job. And by the way, one of the great challenges of being president is figuring how to steer this giant ship and how to get uh, semi-autonomous bureaucracies and agencies to bend to your political will. That is one of the challenges of being president. Right, which he has not been able to do in any way. Not able to do at all. You know, every president, I think, spends some time, this is true of Obama, Bill Clinton, every Republican, Democrat, at first, the, you know, the, the president kind of tells you what to do. You know, you spend some time figuring out what the job is, and then, and then the person slowly figures out how to wield this power, how to, make the, how to fit the presidency to what they want it to do. I mean, Donald Trump just can't get on. He can't yes. board the thing. He, you know, he keeps, he's, um, I don't know what a sports metaphor would be. He can't get on the jet ski. <laughs> yeah, the making right the decision sport. is the easy part. Implementing it and forcing the government to comply to what you've demanded is it's actually like, the, the magic. Maybe getting on a moving carousel. Okay. That's not sports. Cool. I think, uh, 
I think we also learned from this book, I mean, we have heard through leaks over the last year that, you know, there's Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump and Gary Cohn and Dina Powell and this group of uh, moderates in the White House, moderate Democrats or moderate Republicans, whatever they may be, who have tried to steer him in the right direction. Um, and so far, they have all been abject failures in that regard. Yeah. And you, and you sort of understand why that they've been abject failures, and it's because he is this guy who only listens and can only process the last person who's been in his ear, and even then can't focus past the next few minutes or until the next Fox segment. And so even if Ivanka's telling him all the wonderful reasons that we should stay in the Paris Climate Agreement, if Steve Bannon walks into the office five minutes after her and says something different, or if he turns on Sean Hannity and he says something different, that's how that decision's gonna get made. Yeah, it turns out Jared's a conniving little shit. <laughs> He's just not very good at it. Yeah, that's a, those people are not good at their job. Well, you know, I, I feel like, there, you know, is he crazy or is he not crazy? Is he, is he stupid or is he smart? And I think it's a it bit... It almost doesn't matter. It doesn't matter and it's more subtle than that. Whatever, whatever sharpness or innate abilities he may have once had, he has allowed to atrophy by virtue of his disorders, his whatever, narcissism, lack of discipline, uh, laziness, selfishness, and lack yeah, of curiosity. Like we, we keep going through this, you know, there's a million articles today and conversations on all the Sunday shows, like, should we diagnose him? Is it a mental thing? It, it almost doesn't matter. It's, his personality is, will always be unfit for this job. That's just the way it is, whether it is a mental disorder or not. It doesn't matter. He's just, he can't do the job. The other thing I took away from from all of this is, to your point about the, the people who claim that they were saving America, <laughs> you know, I used to give them a little bit more credit uh, in that I recognized that there was virtue in having a few sane people around him. But when you see this book, I, 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 and, and, and as we've seen in the recent, recent, recent weeks, he is so out of control, he is so unable to do the job, he is so disconnected from the job, that actually what we need is much simpler, which is, we don't need a sophisticated group of people pulling the strings. We need, we need to know that there are people who will stop him if he tries to do the big, terrible things. And that's right. it. You know, it doesn't matter whether, Stephen, you know, whether Dina, Dina Powell and Gary Cohn are there to stop Stephen Miller. It all, what matters is having the, the one final check against this person because the reality is there, that for all the ways in which he's not up to the job, all the ways in which he's not sophisticated, he is still the most powerful person in the world, and the hope has to be that for all the criticism and for all the ridiculous and for all the rest, that, there's, that, that people like John Kelly and others who are, you know, whatever they're telling themselves, that if they are put to that one big test that they'll pass it, and I don't know. The book makes me, I get like where the sort of so-called moderates are coming from, and sure, it would, must have been awful fighting against Steve Bannon, like a bona fide racist, awful nut job every day. But I actually ended up holding them in even more contempt yeah. because they yeah. knew goddamn well all along what a bad person Donald Trump is, and they still helped him get fucking elected. And that's a risk that they never should have taken. Right, because the choice, the choice that Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner and Dina Powell and Gary Cohn didn't make was to walk out the front doors of the White House, go in front of a bunch of microphones, and say, this man is crazy and unfit for the job, and he shouldn't be there. And they could have done that, and it might have made a little bit of difference. Maybe it wouldn't have. If Ivanka did it, that, yeah. that, would, <laughs> that would make a big difference. That would have made news. But, like, you know, they, they thought to themselves, we're here because we need to be here, and we need to help this, and if we're not here, worse people are going to be here. And I, I get that rationalization, but they just, they all told Michael Wolf for this book, and they've told, you know, Jonathan Swan and Mike Allen and Maggie Haberman and all these reporters that the guy is crazy. They've but, been doing it for a year, and they just don't say anything about it publicly, because why? Well, that's the, but that, and every single person from the Hill, all the people that know, there's the few crazies, but all the ones who know damn well that he's unfit, from Paul Ryan to Mitch McConnell to Dina Powell to Gary Cohn to all of them, Mattis, McMaster, all of them, they've all made the compromise for themselves that says, this is the world, and I have to do my best within it to function, and this is the moral compromise I'm personally making. But all of them together, have the power to change this. Right. All of them together are making the decision to make this the world. And so it is a collective action failure. It is a tragedy of the commons. None of these people individually are willing to do the right thing. And so all together, they're doing a terrible moral failure, participating and, in a giant moral failure. And speaking of all of them together, the other thing I found very interesting is 
that Donald Trump, from the beginning, this book says, basically outsourced his entire legislative agenda to Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, and especially Paul Ryan, because he hated Paul Ryan during the campaign because Paul Ryan said bad things about him. And then at the beginning of the administration, Paul Ryan walked into the White House and kissed his ass. To the, and, and, to and the was, point where it made Trump's staff embarrassed for Paul Ryan. Right. That's Trump's how staff, <laughs> people who have totally killed the part of themselves that can feel embarrassed, <laughs> murdered it. And basically, Donald Trump said, I'm not interested in policy. I don't care that much. I don't want to know about health care. I don't want to know about the budget. And you go handle it. And so Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell are basically in charge of the U.S. government in terms of domestic policy, in terms of legislation. Um, and that's what we have right now. And that, They're and basically also, two kids wearing a trench coat pretending to be president. <laughs> well, and it also tells you something about why when we're all like, why won't, Paul, why won't Paul Ryan stand up to him? Why won't Mitch McConnell stand up to him? Why won't these Republicans stand up to him? There's two reasons. Number one is they know that this guy will sign whatever bill they send to his desk. It doesn't matter. They, they have cart. They can do whatever they want now. And number two, they also think, well, he's also super popular with the base. And if we go against the base, then we're screwed in our elections. So doesn't hurt him. It hurts us. Right. It hurts us. And so we get whatever legislation we want signed. And we also get to be elected again if we just don't say anything about Donald Trump. And that's the, that's the bargain they've made. And so no matter what Donald Trump does, no matter what awful decision he makes, no matter what awful thing he says, they're thinking to themselves, my career and the legislation that I want is more important. And it's, and it's what we've said for a long time. They're going to tolerate his head as long as his hand can sign things. Yeah. And that's it. Um, so we should talk about the Trump response. On Saturday, he, uh, he accused the Democrats and the media of, quote, taking out the old Ronald Reagan playbook and screaming mental stability and intelligence. Boy. Like, just watch one documentary on Ronald <laughs> Reagan. You know what I mean? There's probably a one-pager somewhere that could show you what actually the truth was about his precipitous mental decline. Right. And I don't know if I'd call that the Ronald Reagan playbook. No, right. um, and then he continued. He learned, you know, he's threading his tweets now. He's, he's learning. Actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been my mental stability and being, like, really smart. <laughs> It's funny that the biggest laugh line tonight is just a verbatim Donald it's Trump true. tweet. I became president of the United States on my first try. Also not true. He ran in 2000. <laughs> on my first try. Um, on my first try. <laughs> what the fuck? It's not riding a bike, you know? Like, what are you doing? On my first try. Like learning to dive. <laughs> I think that would qualify as not smart, but genius. And a very stable genius at that. Um, so that's our president. Uh, and then he gave a press conference at Camp David with all of our favorite Republicans standing behind him. And now we are going to play a little bit of a game. Now for a segment we call OK Stop. We happen to have this, this, a, little, a little snippet of this press conference. Here's how it works. We roll the clip. As it goes, we say OK Stop to talk about it. Let's roll the clip. But this morning you were tweeting about your mental state. Why okay, did stop. you feel that? Mitch McConnell couldn't dress up for this? <laughs> what? So, what's going on? He's yeah. going to so set the scene. Describe this for the people at home. <laughs> uh, so, Donald Trump <laughs> is standing at a podium at Camp David, uh, the, the presidential retreat. Uh, he, behind him uh, are several members of Congress. And his cabinet. And his cabinet. You got, you got Sexy Rexy. Uh, <laughs> Mike Pence is back there. The I CIA director for some reason. Which is deeply strange. <laughs> Mitch McConnell, for those of you at home, has his saddest sad turtle face on right now. <laughs> it is just... Look at that. It's funny, the red sweater and his face are in a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> because the red sweater says, this is fun for me, I'm having a nice time, I'm feeling colorful, I'm in jeans. Uh, <laughs> The jeans are like, what am I, what body is this? <laughs> How did I get with, <laughs> this doesn't, this, does, <laughs> this doesn't feel like a body that wears jeans. <laughs> Look at that face. Okay. I need to tweet about that this morning. Well, only because I went to uh, the best college. Okay, stop. Co <laughs> those are, you can see the souls of the people behind him floating up in the air and disappearing. <laughs> It's like one of those Dementors from Harry Potter came. They just sucked the life out of these fucking people having to listen to him talk about his college. You guys, what, 73? You went to the best colleges. Uh, and, no, you didn't. 
Uh, I went to a uh, — I had a situation where I was a very excellent student, came out, made billions and billions of dollars, became one of the top business people, went to television, and for 10 years was a tremendous success, as you probably — Okay, stop. You hosted The Fucking Apprentice. Many things you can say about someone who hosts a successful reality TV program, but, like, you don't have to be a genius. <laughs> it's not something where they say, oh, we only let the smart ones do that. Yeah. You fired Meatloaf. Yeah, it's not like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not like Kim Kardashian like, goes to a Mensa meeting and then heads over to the yeah. thing. He didn't lose 80 pounds to play a part. He just sat in a fucking boardroom and said, you're fired. Uh, ran for president one time and won. And then I hear this guy that uh, does not know me, doesn't know me at all. By the way, did not interview me for three. He said he interviewed me for three hours in the White House. It didn't exist, okay? It's in stop. His, okay, stop. That is, um, it's not true, apparently. He, uh, Michael Wolf, inter he might not have interviewed him in the Oval Office, but he interviewed him many times and, of course, knows him. So just trying to fact check it, you know. Good. But I don't know this man. I guess uh, Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite okay, a bit. Okay, and... <laughs> Sloppy Steve? I I'm might have gone with, like, schlubby or, like, sloppy, schleppy. Steve. I don't know. Sloppy. It's sloppy like he was Steve. sloppy on his job, but he's also just a sloppy look. Like, I think, I, I, I think it's Steve. one of his better nicknames. It's, look at Kevin McCarthy. It's, like, it's not quite Lion Ted. It's not quite Low Energy yeah. Ted. It's no Little Marco. It's no Little Marco. It's no Little Marco. <laughs> Ke yeah, Kevin McCarthy, you guys can't see right now, but uh, everyone else is trying to do the staid, dear leader face, and um, Kevin McCarthy is losing it. He's just... <laughs> cannot keep up the facade. It's one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. If, if Robert Mueller asks you to come and speak with his committee personally, are you committed still to doing that? Do you believe that's yeah, appropriate? Just so you understand. Just so you understand. There's been no collusion. There's been no crime. And in theory, everybody tells me I'm not under investigation. <laughs> okay, <Stop>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. In theory, my lawyers say I'm good. In theory, where did that come from? It's, in theory. It's in theory, so funny. everybody tells it's me. So it's funny. so funny when he Those words have never appeared next to each other <laughs> in any sentence. In, in theory, theory, everyone everybody tells, tells me. me. The, um, I'm not under investigation. It, I, I never understand when Donald Trump chooses to be lawyerly. Right. You know, like. He'll just look at you and ma tell you a stone-cold lie, and then he'll come back and say, in theory. You know? Yeah. Like, also, there's no crimes. There's no crimes. Four of your associates have been indicted right now. Two have pled guilty. Yeah. You colluded on television. What is the national security advisor? There have been crimes. Indeed. There, are several, there have been several there are crimes. several crimes. Some of them confessed to already. <laughs> and, like, the collusion isn't like, we're not waiting for some smoking gun. He colluded on television. Hack her. He did it. I fired him because I didn't want this Russia thing going on. He, he's told Lester Holt. Yeah, no, it's all out there. But anyway, in theory, Maybe I guess Maybe Hillary not. is, I don't know, but I'm not. But there's been no collusion. There's been no crime. But we have been very open. We could have done it two ways. We could have been very close, and it would have taken years. But, you know, it's sort of like when you've done nothing wrong, let's be open and get it over with. Because, honestly, it's very, very bad for our country. It's making our country look foolish. Okay, stop. And this is <laughs> hey, wait, you know what? That's yes. great. That's a, I'm glad we're in Stockholm. There's hey, definitely something guys, about this making our country look foolish. I want to ask you guys a question. <laughs> All right, you have to decide which has made us look more foolish. <laughs> is it the special counsel provision allowing for an investigation of administration potential crimes during the campaign, or is it the fact that we elected our worst person president? <laughs> this one? Or this one. The Trump one. Yeah. We know where Sweden stands. Yeah. Thank we're you. All, we're also in a part of the world where we don't have to be reminded of uh, the role the Soviets and the Russians have played as an aggressor for a very long time. It's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. <laughs> this is so. true. Countries that I don't want looking foolish. And it's not going to look foolish as long as I'm here. That's interesting. Good way to close. <laughs> That is reassuring, uh, because imagine what it would be like for America to look foolish. Not as long as he's here. So let's talk a little bit about the federal investigation into the president and his associates, which, as we mentioned, has so far led to two guilty pleas from Trump's national security advisor and his foreign policy advisor. 
as well as two additional indictments from Trump's former campaign manager and his deputy. Again, this is just a I, hoax. I, before we even just, that is crazy. That's the end of a story, right? <laughs> that's not the beginning of a story about what's wrong. That's the culmination of a story of historic importance. Right, like you it, haven't had that since Nixon. Well, and also those facts in, in some ways confirm everything that's in the book because none of those people would have taken the jobs that they took, Michael Flynn or Paul Manafort, knowing the things that they had done uh, that would cause them problems that they'd end up lying about if they ever thought Trump was gonna win. Right? It's, they all did this because they thought it would prop them up financially for a while and get them some more fame and fortune because that's how the US political system works. Right, right, they got caught up in this. Um, so, <laughs> before all, the, all of our American political news got sort of swamped by the Wolf book, there was a fairly explosive New York Times story that broke last Thursday uh, about the part of Mueller's investigation that's focused on whether Donald Trump and his associates obstructed justice. Uh, and what we learned from that piece is that Trump tried to do everything he could to prevent Attorney General Jeff Sessions from recusing himself from the Russia investigation because he wanted Sessions to protect him because he thought that the job of the Attorney General was to protect the president. And then we also learned that before Trump fired Comey, a Jeff Sessions aide was running around trying to dig up dirt on Comey and push it to reporters so he could slander Comey in the press, thus making up an excuse to fire him. Joke's on what? you, Sessions <laughs> aide. James Comey is perfect. I was going to say, jo joke's on you, we didn't need the bad stories, we just fired him anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so question, does any of this information advance the case that the president obstructed justice more than we already know. Where does this, where does this leave us? Well, I mean, I, yes. I think that if Mueller's team has confirmed that Trump went to Don McGahn's White House counsel and said, don't let him go, uh, tell him not to, to recuse himself, I think that's probably significant. It also sounds like Reince Priebus, who is the chief of staff, who's since uh, been fired and frog marched out the door, has handed over con contemporaneous notes that buttress the case. There's a lot of evidence in this story that seems like uh, it would very much add to whatever case Mueller is putting together. Yeah. And again, just to reiterate this, because we talked about this before on the pod, the standard for obstruction of justice is corrupt intent here. And so there's a lot of people who say, well, the president, of course, had the authority, ha any president has the authority to fire the FBI director. And, you know, there was a, a lawyer in the White House that came to the conclusion that said, with or without cause, you can fire the FBI director. And that might be true, but you also, you, a president doesn't have the authority to do things if they may also cover up crime. So like, you could not fire the FBI director if you were given a bribe to fire the FBI director. That would still be illegal even though you had the authority to do so. Right, but there are a lot of like, facile arguments about like, well, he can fire him any time he wants for any reason. Like, that's ridiculous. You know, you're allowed to shred, you can have a shredder, you can shred documents whenever you want. You can't come in in the middle of the night and start shredding shit to conceal a crime. You're trying to tell you me know, scissors are illegal now? Right. Like, there's all kinds of things that you have the authority to do, but then when put in the context of yeah. obstruction of justice are illegal. All of this goes to what we already knew. I mean, that feels like the theme of what's happening right now. There's more and more reporting confirming the public shit where the crimes have been committed right before all of our eyes is being affirmed by what's been going on behind the scenes. That yeah. what we didn't know just confirms what we saw on television, which is that Donald Trump fired Comey to obstruct justice. Right. Like, to, I, he practically said it. He said, James, I'm sorry, you have to go. I'm in the process of obstructing justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we know again because the, the, the biggest smoking gun was the day after he fired him and he interviewed, in Lester Holt interviewed him and said, why did you fire this man? And he said, oh, because of the Russia thing. <laughs> And then Russians came to the White House. The Russian foreign minister was in the Oval Office. And he said, oh, you know, I fired the FBI director, you know, and I was facing a lot of pressure because of that, this Russia thing. That's not happening anymore. Yeah. Again, it's all right there in plain sight. So I guess the question is, is there a scenario where the president could have obstructed justice even if he didn't have any crimes to cover up? Like, is it possible that there is, that, that Mueller ends up with, no actual collusion or crimes of collusion connected to Donald Trump, 
but that he still committed obstruction of justice because he hated the investigation into him so much that it just wasn't giving him good enough press. And so he was so angry about that that then he obstructed justice. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's that, possible, right? It's one of the weird things about Donald Trump is that he just lies so casually. Like, he can be swinging a golf club while a reporter watches him and he says, I never play golf. I mean, he'll go to a course for four hours and they'll be like, no, 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 he didn't play golf. What are you talking about? So in the course of that process, I guess he could lie to the FBI or someone relevant in this process and get himself in trouble. That's what I'm waiting for. At some point, if the FBI, if Mueller actually interviews Donald Trump, if they put him under oath in some way, I don't think things are going to go too well for him. So that's, that's a, just a guess. I know he can be very disciplined if he needs to be. <laughs> well, no, but that's, that's an interesting question. So I find myself not sure how much of, like, how much of the decline we're seeing is something he can contain, right? How much of this is a lack of discipline? Because during the campaign, there, he was deposed. He was deposed <coughs> the, as... Uh, Jose Andres thing. Yeah, as part of the uh, legal proceedings around Jose Andres pulling out of the restaurant uh, that he was going to open at, at Trump's D.C. hotel because Jose Andres didn't want to be associated uh, with a fascist hamburger. Um, <laughs> and in that deposition, it's fascinating. You can go watch it. It's online. And you see the Donald Trump that is not on television, that is his most controlled, that is aware that if he lies, it's a crime, or at least yeah. will have negative consequences for him. And it is, it's still him, but it is more contained, and it does seem like more rational and more in control, and so I don't totally know like how it, much it, of that guy is left. It's possible if he knows his ass is on the line, that like, if this, if this goes south, you're either going to jail or, at the very least, or there's gonna be impeachment proceedings, or there's gonna be a big problem that maybe yeah. he can pull himself together enough mm -hmm. to tell the truth. I mean, Donald Trump has trained himself to lie because he's trained himself to not fear the consequences of the lies coming out a week right. from now, two weeks from now. He'll just lie again in the future. That's something he can deal with. There's always another lie to make up for the last lie. Right. That's how he glides through his despicable Because the worst lie. that can happen is people in the press and Say Democrats can yell at you and yeah. whatever. He can get but past he, that. But there are the lies you can't get out of. Um, the ones that you tell under oath, yeah. Yeah. Right. So in case you're wondering whether congressional Republicans will do anything about Trump's potential crimes, there's also been more evidence over the last few days that the only actions that they're planning on taking are to actively help Trump cover these potential crimes up. It turns out that the only person Republicans in Congress want to investigate in relation to Russian interference in our election and Trump potential collusion is the British spy who found evidence of Russian interference in our election and Trump potential collusion. And so these congressional committees have been investigating the Russia stuff for a year now and Trump, and they have one recommendation out of this committee from Lindsey Graham and Chuck Grassley to go to, they, they believe that uh, Christopher Steele lied to the FBI. This is, this is what they're doing now. Yeah, that's very strange, huh? And, I mean, <laughs> they made, Grassley and Senator Graham made what's called a referral to the Department of Justice where they said you should look into this. Really, anyone can do that. It doesn't mean they'll pick it up. It doesn't mean there'll be a case or a prosecution. But it is very significant that a senator of that stature would send that letter and do something like that. It's also very strange to me because like, the underlying crime, allegedly, in the Trump case is that he, he or his campaign conspired with the Russians to, to change the outcome of our election. The underlying allegation here about Christopher Steele is that he talked to journalists about what he found in the course of his research, which is not a crime uh, in, in any scenario. I guess they're saying he lied about it to them, but I'm still not really sure what the sort of base case here, like what is the relevance of that fact? Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's two things going on, and they're both about obfuscation. So on the Steele front, there's like sort of a, you step back and there's sort of a deeper lie or deeper manipulative effort going on, and it's basically to try to disqualify the entire Russia investigation by disqualifying the Steele dossier. And you guys remember the Steele dossier, it's where the, the rumor of the sort of... PP tape. The, the P, P tape, tape, John. Which, you know, because we don't live in the simulation where there is a P tape, it will never come out, it's just something we'll dream of. Um, <laughs> this is not going to be you a P tape. dream of the P tape. The P tape is a fantasy, we hope is true, but regardless, the dossier, you know, they're trying to disqualify the dossier to disqualify the whole investigation, but reports, including the New York Times and elsewhere over the course of the past couple of weeks, have made it clear that the dossier is not 
the whole source of this investigation, that the dossier confirmed some stuff that they had separately, that there was a larger investigation going on because of Papadopoulos and others. So No, he got drunk in London and told the Australian ambassador yeah. that there were uh, Russian crimes. And it set off a whole thing because that's crazy. And then the, <laughs> <laughs> and the second part of this is trying to boil the entire Russia investigation down to did Trump personally collude with Putin to do this? And while it's important to find that out, what is undeniable and what is tremendously important for our democracy, and by the way, your democracy and every democracy in Europe, is Russia's attempts to influence and undermine uh, Western democracies around the world. And that unequivocally happened, and it is dangerous. And the point Mark Warner has made over and over again, which is important, is, okay, you, you've made this entirely about you. It is incredibly important that we safeguard our elections from Russia moving forward, but because Trump has made it about himself, and the Republicans are carrying his water, we're actually not doing what we need to do to protect ourselves. What Grassley's trying to do it is actually even a step crazier, which is they're trying to say the Clinton campaign, in, at least in part, paid for the Steele dossier, which pushed it over to the Obama-run FBI, which kicked off an investigation. So this whole thing is Hillary's fault, like everything else in our fever dream of an existence over the last 30 right. fucking years. Which is just, can I, I mean, Lindsey Graham, wasn't he normal at some point? Yeah, you know, like a Republican we disagreed with, that you know we, did, but like he used to, he, he at one point he said Donald Trump was a kook who, yeah. who shouldn't be in office. It, there's a bunch of other Republicans who were still self against to Donald Trump, but said you know on this Russia thing we still need to know what's happening, what's going on, we need to investigate it. It seems like it's deteriorated even worse than than it started yeah. uh, in the in the last couple I mean, months, and <laughs> maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's happened as as Mueller has started handing down indictments and we've seen more evidence. I don't know what's going on with Lindsey. I mean, look, Lindsey Graham was never, was never an ally here. No. But he was one of those people on the list with the Corkers and Flakes and McCains of the world that once in a while would remember that they liked to believe that they had really strong principles. Uh, and, they would, and he once in a while would act on them. And, then, and they'd then, put that statement out and then they'd be like, ah, that was my principle. Of the day. Yeah, you see it? It's a statement. Principles. And, uh, <laughs> it's all right there. It's right there in my statement. But, the, uh, but Lindsey Graham has he's gone down a path. He golfed with Donald Trump, and that was it. He was Are, hooked. I don't know if we're just becoming numb to it or what. Like, the other thing I noticed this last week is, and I don't know if it's everyone's just getting back from break, and they're all negotiating the spending deal that we're about to talk about, but there weren't a lot of Democrats out there this last week just sort of screaming about this. I mean, they have, they, they're telling the Justice Department to investigate Hillary Clinton's emails again. They're trying to, you know, indict Christopher Steele, <laughs> investigate Christopher Steele as the British spy who tried to warn us about Russian interference. Um, Paul Ryan is letting Devin Nunes, who's already been disgraced because he did one shitty thing with the White House, to just go on another fishing expedition. Like, it, there's just, the Republicans are engaged in sort of a vast conspiracy to help Donald Trump cover up potential crimes, and I don't see, like, I saw Adam Schiff out there talking about this, but I don't see a ton of Democrats yelling about this, and I don't know what's going on. Is it because we feel like there's nothing much we can do now except focus on the 2018 elections, you know, get these Republicans out of office and go from there, or what? Dan made this point on Thursday's show about the fact that we don't just need to scream about this, but we actually have to lay out what exactly we want to do to hold Trump accountable on right. these matters, on these not policy, not like Democrat, not uh, domestic policy matters like health care and, and taxes, but what are we going to do on the institutional questions that Donald Trump has raised and the Republicans have failed on? I think that's really important, but I think part of the reason we don't have those steps is I think Democrats, we know we need to focus on health care. We know we need to focus on taxes. And we also know we need to have the right things to say about investigating and holding Trump accountable. Right. But I don't think as a party we know where we're supposed to land. And I think there's a bit of fatigue on the part of Senate Democrats to just continue to beat this drum. Like, they think they're more comfortable fighting on health care, they're more comfortable fighting on CHIP, more comfortable fighting on taxes. And maybe ultimately that's where we'll win, so it's okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I would just say to Democrats, it's, it's, it's not like you need to be talking about the Russia thing all the time. Because this is actually broader than the Russia thing. This is about sort of the Republicans in Congress degrading our institutions and the rule of law. Um, there's all these norms around the Justice Department and what it should do and how it should be independent and how the Federal Bureau of Investigation should be independent and when you should investigate someone and when you shouldn't. And this goes beyond, like, is there a P-tape and a Russia scandal that we should all be talking about? This is about our institutions. 
You know, I think that someone, I think that many yeah. Democrats need to st stand up and make those points. I think part of it is, I think we're all a bit, we're still in a kind of daze. We're still in the, oh, oh shit, Trump won. Right. What does that say about what people care about? Right. And I think we know people care about pocketbook issues. We know that. Right. And I think Democrats, we really don't, I think it's, a, I think it's an open question. I think, I think one of the most troubling things about Trump is we should just face it. It's an open question as to how much in the voting booth, in an election, you can make issues of norms and institutions and civic virtues around governance part of how you win. Uh, and I don't think we know the answer to that. And I think there's Democrats who just are retreating to safer ground. And, and that may be okay, but I think you're right that these are issues that are incredibly important to talk about. Okay. One last question, and then we'll get to our game. The thing that, it, that Democrats and Republicans are focusing on this week is um, they're currently trying to reach a deal that will fund our government for more than a month or two at a time, which would actually be relatively new for us in America. Hold on a second. S Swedes. <laughs> are you guys are just you going guys on, on a three weekly week? budget? <laughs> Your government funded by the, by the fortnight? <laughs> or uh, you guys have a longer process? Do you guys have those kinds of, sh you guys have these showdowns every couple of weeks? Applaud if you do. Well, right. fuck. That seems... <laughs> I think you're so hot. Highly functioning. <laughs> Bunch of arrogant Scandinavian oh. bastards think you're better than us <laughs> with your... <laughs> with your functioning, <laughs> with your functioning government, <laughs> your generous social You're insurance program. You're not better program. than us. <laughs> oh, we had some hisses. <laughs> See what you did? You took it across the ocean. Enjoy your it. iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, Foxconn? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, so the big, the big controversial sticking points are uh, a whether we'll fund the bipartisan children's health insurance program that guarantees coverage to nine million American children and B, whether we'll protect at least 800,000 young American immigrants known as dreamers from being deported in March. Trump is now saying that he will only protect the dreamers if he gets $18 billion for more fencing on the U.S.-Mexican border, which he's calling his wall. Uh, he also wants 10,000 additional immigration officers and other immigration restrictions. So, should, question, is there a world where Democrats make a deal on border security in order to protect the dreamers, or do we hold still and say, absolutely no deal on anything else, and if Trump wants to shut the government down over this wall, he can shut the government down over the wall? <sighs> I, I think this is an easy one, um, because I think this is kind of a type of politics that existed before Trump, and I think because Trump is so heinous and he's made this whole thing about the wall, which is such you know, Stupid. dumb nonsense that he just clicked in on because it rallied some, some old southern white people on his tour. You know, we have to remember that any compromise in immigration, going back to when we went during, to Reagan, to George W. Bush, to, Clinton, to do whatever Obama proposed, it was always a compromise that was about legalization, path to legalization, protecting the dreamers, and money for border security and interior enforcement. And we should be open to that deal. We should fight really hard. We should actually make sure that enforcement is about holding companies accountable and not punishing hardworking people who are here just doing jobs. We have to make sure it's compassionate and we shouldn't just fund a dumb law. But I think we can call border security. Donald Trump can go on television and call border security, which was going to be part of any deal, his great wall, and he can take that. And then we can protect the 800,000 people that deserve to stay in America because it's the only home they've ever known. Yeah, to, to me, this is um, analogous to what just happened on health care, which is they repealed the individual mandate, which was not a good thing, and it's going to lead to higher premiums, but it is far, far, far short of repealing Obamacare. It's not touching Medicaid. It's not touching any of the subsidies or anything else. Nevertheless, once it happened, Trump went out on TV and said, individual mandate was central to Obamacare, which means now we've repealed Obamacare. It's gone. Don't talk about it again. Yeah, he, can, he, can, he, can, he can put a little bomb on a psychic wound that's just for him. He just wanted to say it was forward. dead. If it, yeah. I mean, they're already saying that some of this money on the border fencing would not build a wall, but it would repair some fencing that's already on the border. Like, if that ends up what it is, and Trump wants to go out and say, this is my wall, and it's just actually right. patching up a fucking 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 bricks fence. in a pile, he can take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the, the key, I mean, knowing that a government shutdown is actually a big deal and hurts a lot of people, knowing that, like, the clock is ticking on kids getting health insurance as we get further and further from CHIP being authorized and we're going to get to a point where you know, dreamers are getting, you know, having to leave the country en masse. I think the politics of a government shutdown is ultimately good for Democrats and very bad for the party in charge so that we should fight to have every single priority we have in there. It is like hard for me to swallow an idea as stupid as 18 billion 
dollars for a fucking phony wall that won't work and is probably not real anyway, but maybe that's where we are. We've yeah. got 18 billion dollar helicopters that can't fly. We've paid for dumber shit. <laughs> I think we got to watch it. I think we got to make sure that like some of the some of the things that maybe. they want, some of the like poison pills that fucking C plus Santa Monica fascist Stephen Miller are inserting in this deal about cutting legal immigration and chain migration and stuff like that. That's all the it, shit they're trying to jam to in point, late too, right? Right, and it could get to a point where we, it's too much and we've got to say no. But I think the most important thing for Democrats is no Democrat should vote to fund a government that will deport 800,000 people who it promised to protect. And no Democrat should vote to fund a government that will not extend insurance to 9 million American children. And yeah. we have to just be absolutely firm on that and not and that, take that up. That has to be a line, that has to be a line that Senate Democrats understand is something that is being drawn by the millions of people that have become engaged in a way they haven't been before, that have been paying attention, that these are the people that are going to deliver the House, these are the people that can deliver the Senate, and whatever they think about the broader politics of immigration, whatever they think about that, this is a moment where the entire Democratic base is looking to see if Democrats are going to give them something to vote for. Mm -hmm. And if they let us down, I think we have to unleash holy hell, but we have to just push them right now to do the right thing. Okay. When we come back... We'll have another game. Pot Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. Oh, good. Start the new year by upgrading your old, uncomfortable underwear to Tommy John, the revolutionary comfort company for the modern man. You know, John, I want to tell you something. In my house in L.A. right now, I only have three pairs of Tommy John underwear. Do you want to know why? Mm, why? Because Delta has my suitcase with all my other Tommy John underwear which means my full switch to Tommy John has been jeopardized by the people at Delta. And by the time people are listening to this ad, we'll be in Europe. And, and I, the question of whether you have more underwear or just those three pairs will have been answered. I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll have to <laughs> turn them inside out. <laughs> when was the last time you said, I love my underwear? Uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> when you switch to Tommy John, you'll be saying just that. Tommy John's committed to providing mind-blowing comfort, not just in their underwear, <laughs> But in all of their incredible apparel. Okay. Okay. Okey Tommy John's innovative designs and patented fabrics ensure that your underwear will never ride up, the waistband will never roll down, and you'll never get a wedgie. You hear that, Syosset High School class of 2000? <laughs> you with, hear that? With Tommy John, your days of readjusting are over. No more fixing wedgies. You stay completely nestled at all times. And it's not just their underwear that's phenomenal. Their apparel is too. That includes <laughs> undershirts that stay tucked in, socks that never fall down, second skin tee so soft you won't believe it, and all Tommy John underwear is backed by the best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Hurry to tommyjohn.com slash crooked and get 20% off your first order. That's tommyjohn.com slash crooked for 20% off. tommyjohn.com. We're switching to Tommy John. We're not wearing the other underwear anymore. Slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Honey. There's an amazing free browser extension called Honey. Huh. That millions and millions of people use every day millions to save and millions money. Millions is not a technical term. It's not. Millions and millions. It works on Chrome, Firefox, Safari, all the major browsers. You know, Carl Sagan was, you, they used to say he would say things, there were billions and billions, but he never actually said the phrase billions and billions because he was precise. And it's always free. It only <laughs> takes two clicks to add Honey to your browser, then it starts working in the background right away. What is it, you may ask? While you shop, Honey scans and tests millions of coupon codes all over the internet to find you the biggest discount on everything you buy online. No more Googling random coupon. Coupon? Coupon. I say coupon. I don't coupon. say coupon. I just, I just trying it out. What do you guys say? What do you guys say? <laughs> coupon. Yeah. Who's saying coupon? I said coupon at first, if you heard, but I, I know. just wanted to make sure. You're right. you sort of looked at me when I said coupon at first. You know what? I'm struggling to find were... a you catch more bees with honey thing, but Oh, that's discounts. what you were doing. Interesting. No more Googling random coupon codes that don't end up working, but here's the best part of it all. Whenever you're ready to check out, honey automatically applies the best coupon to your cart. Excellent. What a wonderful thing. We should probably start making some of our purchases with honey, John. We should. You catch more bees with honey. There you go. There's no reason not to add honey to your browser. It's free. It will save There's you cash. There's nothing that sounds like bee that's a discount. I've been trying. Catch more... Savings. Savings. <laughs> Does saving sound bee. like bee? Uh, it will save you cash on everything you were going to you buy You catch anyway. more free with honey. Oh! <laughs> that's almost there. Somebody should pay me for this. Maybe honey. They are. <laughs> okay, cool. If you're not using honey when you shop, you're missing out on free money. You catch more free with honey. Add honey to your browser <laughs> for free right now at joinhoney.com slash PSA. That's joinhoney.com slash PSA. Because remember what I always say, you catch more free <laughs> with honey. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, give me my bag, Delta. <laughs> And we're back! Now for a game that we call Stockholm Syndrome. Sorry about the name, guys. There were some backups, but this is what we went with. Uh, here's how it works. Donald Trump and Republicans have spent a lot of time uh, using Sweden like a pejorative. Oh, you're going to make America like Sweden. I'm sorry, but it's what goes on. Uh, and so we wanted to quiz one of you about the ways in which Sweden has been used in this manner. So would anybody here like to play Stockholm Syndrome? This person in the front row is waving. Did you say, did you scream Seattle? Seattle. Your merch is in Seattle. Oh, well, maybe we'll, we'll call on you there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Hi, Emily. Emily. Yes. Are you from Stockholm? I'm from Gävle, outside of Stockholm. I... It's a different town. What's, where are you from? What's it called? Gävle. No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> what was it? Gävle. And what was your name? Emily. <laughs> so it's Emily from Gävle. Gävle. <laughs> so, Emily. Yeah. Your first question, Emily from Yarvin. <laughs> <laughs> After Donald Trump mistakenly referred to a non-existent terror attack in Sweden, Fox News host Bill O'Reilly interviewed Swedish defense and national security advisor Niles Bilt to provide insight into the extremist violence occurring in Sweden. The Swedish government released a statement admonishing Fox for inviting Niles Bilt to speak. Why? Was it A? His appearance on American television was not authorized by the Swedish government. Was it B? He revealed classified information about an ongoing security operation. Was it C? He flew business class to the U.S., which was very expensive. Or was it D? He is not a Swedish defense and national security advisor. He does not live in Sweden, and his name is not Niles Bilt. The answer is D. That is right. Nice job, Emily. How did that... Did you guys all catch up with that? Did that all... You guys all saw that happen? Yeah. Did that piss you guys off? Yeah. Cool, us too. Question number two, Emily. Senator Bernie Sanders, a Democratic Socialist, ran an insurgent primary campaign against Hillary Clinton in 2016, often drew criticism from Republicans for his left-wing platform. Which Republican said the following? Quote, I think Bernie Sanders is a good candidate for president of Sweden, <laughs> even though Sweden does not have a president. Was it A... Paul Ryan, before endorsing Donald Trump. B. Marco Rubio, before endorsing Donald Trump. C. Mitch McConnell, before endorsing Donald Trump. Or D. Hillary Clinton, before it all fell apart and we ended up in this nightmare hellscape. <laughs> Paul Ryan? It was Marco Rubio. Ooh. Uh, who, by the way, I will separately point out, was at, <laughs> said he used to say the line about Norway, but he's like, he got in trouble because Norway doesn't have a president. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, let's take them behind the curtain at Crooked Media for a second. We have two conference rooms. One is large, one is small. What are their names? Uh, Big Marco and Little Marco. Good. We have a good time. Our staff work. did that. Sweden doesn't have a president either. We know. That was the whole thing. Keep up. <laughs> okay, listen. I, di I didn't think I'd have to do this in Europe. Here's the thing about shouting things from the crowd. You've got to be so sure that you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'm just, I'm just... Emily, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for me, and I'm sorry for that person. <laughs> Question number three. In a debate about income inequality, one conservative offered the following rebuke to liberals. You said, gosh, these executives make too much money. I don't think the government should be in the business of deciding what you get paid. In socialist countries like Sweden and Denmark, if you are born poor, you usually stay poor. Who said it? Yeah, you don't like it, do you? <laughs> Who said it? Was it A? Paul Ryan, before voting for a tax bill to make school supplies more expensive for teachers. Was it B? Mitch McConnell, before voting to cut Medicaid for millions of working people. Was it C? Ted Cruz, despite the fact that study after study has shown that there is more economic mobility in countries with a strong social safety net, and that in America, you're more likely to be stuck in the same economic situation as your parents than you are in countries like Sweden and Denmark. 
Or was it D? Bernie Sanders, but like he was being sarcastic. <laughs> That's a hard one, but I'm gonna go with C. Nailed it. <laughs> Emily, you have gotten two out of three correct. Uh, but this last question is, is for all the marbles. Do you have that saying here? <laughs> it means for all the things. The whole enchilada. <laughs> question number four. Guys, can you focus? Yeah, 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 no, go ahead. These are funny. Go ahead. Em Emily, again. I'm sorry. How are you, Emily? Great. In okay. Yeah. Thank you for wearing the merch. You're welcome. Question. It costs a ton in shipping and customs fees, so you should be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> you get the hum. You get the incorrect sound. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you are now two for four. Question number five. <laughs> This is some good news. Sweden does have at least one big Republican fan. His name is Donald Trump. How do we know this? Donald Trump pretended to be of Swedish ancestry for decades, including uh, the lie in his book, The Art of the Deal. What are Donald Trump's true familial origins? Was it A? Donald was found in a crashed alien craft in Kansas by lovely farmers named Jonathan and Martha Trump, who raised the boy as their own. Was it B? Fred Trump, Donald's father, who was one of those guys that snuck onto the lifeboats on the Titanic before the women and children, because <laughs> that kind of makes sense. <laughs> was it C? The Trump family was German, but pretended to be Swedish to avoid angering Jewish tenants during World War II, and then just kind of went with it because it seemed cool. Or was it D? No one knows where Donald Trump came from. We all actually can't remember anything before 2016. We are all in a simulation, and we just relive the Trump presidency over and over again to see if we ever figure out how to save ourselves. They've done the simulation 14,000 times. <laughs> It'll end when we get it right. <laughs> okay, the answer is C. I forgot that there was a quiz. <laughs> So, Emily, who paid for the shipping, for the merch, you've won the game. Woo! And for that, you will get a lovely one of these Pod Save America hats, shipping included, because Tanya's handing it to you right now. <laughs> Guys, give it up for Emily. Thank you to John and Tommy, because they sat there while I screwed up the intro. <laughs> to the game. When we come back, some Q&A with you guys. Pod Save America is brought to you by Upside. Oh, Upside, the travel site. Maybe they could have helped me because I can't get my suitcase back from Delta. I was going to say, feel like this one's offering us a real opening. Keep going. How's your things to do in 2018 checklist coming along? It's shit, John. You know why I've been able to do a fucking thing except call Delta? to try to get my suitcase. And I know what you're thinking. Why'd you check a bag? Love it. Don't you know not to check it? Yeah, thank you for that fucking piece of advice that Ben Stiller had on an airplane and, and meet the parents in 1997. I know not to check a bag, but I had to. These ads will be heard a couple days from now. What happens if Delta has made you a Diamond member and giving you a, a $10,000 credit by then? Then I will issue a fulsome, not apology, but a follow-on explanation. I'll never apologize. It's 2017. No one apologizes. Anyway, back to Upside. Upside. I do have one thing on my to-do list that belongs on every business traveler's list. Book your next business trip at Upside.com. When you do, you'll get the better business travel experience you deserve. I could use yep, it, John. You could. And, and, and a free pair of Bose SoundLink wireless headphones. That's cool. More on that in that. a second. We're going to come back to that. First, though, here's why you'll love Upside.com. Only Upside has customer service specialists who look out for you every step of the way on your business trip, handling any problem that might pop up. Their team is hard at work 24-7 to make sure your flight, hotel, and rental car all go off without a hitch. They're available on demand by chat, phone, and email whenever you need them. Do you think that maybe you should have used Upside to avoid this baggage to-do that you're facing? Honestly, wish I could book a time machine with Upside and go back and have Upside. Don't end up like Love It. Use Upside. Only Upside monitors your business trip around the clock, proactively keeping you posted on everything from the weather in the city you're going to to changing your flight home so you can adjust your meeting schedule. Have you ever experienced that level of service before on a business trip? 
from Delta? No. They got a boot on my neck, John. <laughs> All that plus upside has great prices for flights, hotel, and rental cars. Now, to get your free pair of Bose SoundLink wireless headphones, just book your first business trip with Upside by going to upside.com slash crooked media. That's upside.com slash crooked media. Upside.com slash crooked media. <clears throat> and to claim your Bose SoundLink wireless headphones. I love these headphones. I have them. They're excellent. They're the greatest headphones you'll use. Upside.com. You deserve a better business trip. Headphones available while supplies last. Must be first upside purchase. $600 minimum purchase required. See site for complete details. So yeah, there's a few things that you have to do there to get All the right. headphones. Upside.com slash Crooked Media. We don't need a whole fucking summary, you know? Get the headphones. Use Upside. Don't lose your bags. I don't know that they can solve that problem. And of course, Pod Save America is brought to you by the Cash App. Pod Save America is brought to you by the Cash App, as you know. <laughs> We're using the Cash App. You know what? You know, so for example, today I'm going to send via the Cash App some cash to Tanya because Tanya was going to Target and I said, hey, we're going to Europe. Do me a solid. Get me a silly hat. Get me a silly hat. And boy, is that hat silly. <laughs> she brought it in this morning before you got here and I said, that is the perfect John Lovett hat. It's perfect. She nailed it. She hit the nail on the head. So now and she gets money via the Cash App. She gets money via the Cash App because we're not using the other apps anymore. Now, because Tanya is a Crooked Media employee and already has the Cash App on her phone, she didn't need to download it for the first time. But if you're not Tanya, you should download it for the first time and you should put in the code PODSAVE because that's going to give you $5 and $5 is going to go to World Central Kitchen, which is feeding hungry people in Puerto Rico. We're switching to the Cash App. Do it. Okay, we have time for a couple questions. Hi, I'm Peter from Sweden. Hello. From Stockholm. Uh, so, uh, in Sweden, we have eight uh, parties in Congress, in Parliament. Uh, hearing about your grievances about splits in the Democratic Party, and if you like, consider the thought experiment of having maybe a Mitt Romney party and a Donald Trump party in 2016, do you like, uh, hope and in any way expect that there are uh, two parties in 100 years in the States, or mm. don't you? I mean, I just I think that... I, I think that the way we're going you could see an independent run for president and succeed. I, I, would, I would have never said that in a pre-Trump era, but now that Donald Trump's president, anything's sort of possible. But I do think that our two-party system right now makes it extraordinarily difficult for a third party or a fourth party to pop up and take hold. I think the Electoral College makes that really tricky. I think um, the way that congressional districts are drawn makes that tricky. Like, there's just a, a lack lot of, of proportional representation makes makes that tricky. I mean, the right. U.S. has four parties. They're just stuck into two cat. Like, the Republican Party has the corporate conservative wing, and it has this nationalist front. Uh, and the Democratic Party has the Bernie Sanders left wing, and it has a more center left party inside of itself. We just fight a lot of these things out inside of primaries and, and because of the way our system is designed, there's just, it's harder for a third party to emerge. And also, it's, you gotta want it. Like, I don't think the Mitt Romney party uh, is pretty much just gonna have Mitt Romney in it because uh, <laughs> the, other, the other possibilities, Bob Corker, Jeff Flake, all those guys, you know, they decided to quit and, and supposed to stay and fight right. Donald Trump. And so if you did, if you had this, this portion of Republicans who really despised Donald Trump, who were in elected office and had this following in the country of Republicans who thought likewise, like our, our friend Tim Miller, who, who uh, is one of our contributors and plenty of other Republicans we know, they would go do that and they would field candidates and they would try to do this. But they just, a, a lot of them don't want to do it. They don't want to battle Donald Trump because they're afraid of right-wing media. They don't think they're supporting the base. They don't think that the money, that they can get money from donors. And so the will has to be there to actually have that fight. And I think right now on the right side of the spectrum, that will isn't there. Um, and on the left side of the spectrum, I don't think the splits between um, sort of the Bernie supporters on the left, or on the far left, and a lot of the center left folks are that extreme. Even as they were, in the, the, the Democrats are more ideologically united, at least elected Democrats, than they have been in some time. Um, but if it gets to that point, you actually need the people to go fight for that, and I don't see the will there. And just one other thing, that this point, you've made it a lot, we've made it a lot, 
one lesson of Trump is there actually wasn't a big constituency for the Paul Ryan agenda. There, that, that's not what the, certainly not what Democrats wanted. And it turns out it wasn't what Republicans wanted. Trump, Trump ran roughshod of these people on, on trade, on immigration. He, didn't, he wasn't pushing a, a more right-wing tax policy. He ended up voting for it because, because he ended up signing it because he didn't care because he outsourced it to Paul Ryan. But, you know, deregulation and cutting taxes for billionaires doesn't have a party. In, fa in fact, it's what may bring Trump and the Republican Party down in 2018. Not some of the things that Donald Trump ran on, but some of the things that Paul Ryan pushed him on, which are cutting taxes <laughs> and taking away Obamacare. That's what may do them in in 2018. Thank you. Uh, Sebulon from Lean Shopping, and my question is to Tommy. I really like Pod Save the World. Thank you. So it's a short question. Tanya's wearing the shirt. Uh, <laughs> so, what do you believe is the trajectory of on foreign policy views within the Democratic Party? On foreign policy views? This is hard. I, I don't know. Um, the challenge is the Obama versus Clinton fights on foreign policy were sort of the last big inter-party debate we had. And that almost entirely revolved around the Iraq war, uh, which ultimately was a pretty obvious answer, right? Like she voted for a war that was a fucking disaster that we're still paying for, that has led to uncertainty in the region, the rise of ISIS, like all these challenges. Barack Obama was opposed to it, and it was a very clear contrast and probably the reason he was able to win. Obama, when he got in office, had talked about you know, how we needed to win the war in Afghanistan, how we needed to get tougher on Al-Qaeda in certain parts of the country. And then I think Democrats were actually kind of shocked when he followed through on some of those promises, in including going after bin Laden in Pakistan, increasing uh, targeted strikes against um, targets in various places, and sending tens of thousands of troops to Afghanistan. Both sides seem to, in the last election, have coalesced around a desire to pull back militarily from the world in a pretty significant way. And unfortunately, on the right, that's been coupled with a desire to pull back in, diplomatically in terms of diplomacy generally, contact with the world, attempting to lead in trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership to pull back on foreign aid. I don't know what those fights are going to look like the next go-around. It's hard to see because the focus right now is so domestic in nature and like we're always fighting about social and economic issues first that foreign policy almost gets second shift but you know i think hopefully the good thing about the obama administration is there was this reflexive uh assumption that republicans were muscular and democrats were soft and that the muscular foreign policy the more militaristic foreign policy was the one that was electorally effective and can be used as a cudgel to whack democrats in an election i think obama reversed that thinking somewhat uh and i'm hopeful that can lead us to make slightly more intelligent informed decisions going forward even in the context of a political process that said like right now we're having a big debate over Iran and the Iran deal we cut to reduce the threat from their nuclear program, and it's still just as fucking stupid as, as all the other debates we have in Washington, so maybe we haven't learned our lesson yet. All right, that's it. Stockholm, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone else. We'll be back with the pod on Thursday, our live show from Oslo. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And good night. <laughs>